Hi everyone, how are you? <coughs> so, how was the exam? Uh, I will try to finish uh, as early as possible, uh, though I haven't been able to start yet the grading. And then, uh, <coughs> like to return the result to you, each of you, uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I'll try. Um, also, I, I forgot to mention uh, that the uh, the reason why I actually suddenly in the middle uh, of the lecture switched into something a uh, little bit of the uh, the previous semester's format uh, lecture was because uh, the later part of the unit one of the textbook uh, the contents some contents uh, included there was uh, like uh, I didn't want to cover those content because it's not really. Uh, <coughs> Productive uh, to the overall scheme of this lecture. That's why I and also I wanted to add on a little bit of the extra material uh, regarding the topic. So once we finish, get to finish this uh, part, then uh, we are going to return to the unit two of the, uh, the this semester's textbook again. Uh, that's how I am planning on to. So okay, so. Uh, picking up what we have left uh, last semester, uh, last lecture uh, last week before the midterm exam, of course. Uh, several. Let's take a look at the uh, several uh, two or three examples, of actually examples of the fossil records. Because uh, what we, where were we uh, last week? So in order to uh, establish correct the evolutionary relationship and traditionally speaking although in these days the DNA the molecular record DNA sequence uh, comparison is one of the most reliable parameter with which we can pretty pretty much accurately uh, determine the relative the relationship among uh, different organisms present today and even that technology can also be applied to the dead, long gone, extinct uh, animal and plants. That's another uh, beauty of this um, molecular DNA analysis as a tool to tool in uh, phylogenetics. But still, the Many uh, fossil record data uh, can be utilized very valuable, uh, uh, give us a very valuable information on regarding many of those, uh, especially in the past, uh, how were those uh, organisms <coughs> related so, to one another in terms of the common ancestral thing because a common ancestor of the form of a common ancestor can only be found in the form of fossils because they no longer exist as I mentioned briefly in the previous lecture again so uh, having said that uh, so there are many uh, examples of fossil records but one of the most uh, dramatic uh, fascinating uh, fossil would be probably this Archaeopteryx. Um, the Archaeopteryx, a meaning actually in Greek, the ancient feather wings. So it is something like a dinosaur having wings. So many scientists believe that it is an intermediate uh, form between reptiles, which include the reptile means the dinosaur. So, during the course of evolution, uh, many different forms of a dinosaur, and one of them uh, could have been the flying form of a dinosaur. And we all, uh, nowadays, correctly believe that the present-day birds are actually derived from dinosaur. So, we can say that all birds were evolved from reptiles, and so this is one of the intermediate between in between the middle ground between 
the uh, dinosaur like uh, reptiles and the present day uh, birds uh, is the uh, common notion uh, about this Archaeopteryx. However, there are certain uh, some of the the evidence contradicting to this uh, notion. Uh, although it is not entirely in general, but uh, a, a couple of at least a few uh, evidence of the, the Archaeopteryx which uh, suggest that it might not. It might not be uh, the Archaeopteryx as uh, actually the, the can uh, represent the, the intermediate form between birds and the dinosaur. Uh, and actually, uh, that a little the uncomfortable findings uh, st stirred up in uh, several years ago, stirred up. Uh, especially in this country, uh, the it created a, a, some controversy, which actually uh, led to some entire uh, administrative uh, changes in the science education in high school. Uh, so some of the the. Organization, actually, I shouldn't say some of the one particular organization, which is an ad, uh, so Christianity oriented organization, and which is a strong advocate advocate of this uh, the biblical creationism, uh, pointed out this uh, little bit of inconsistency in this. <coughs> Archaeopteryx uh, saga, and on the other hand, uh, at the time in the high school biology textbook, it was like a straightforward described as this Archaeopteryx is uh, something that represents the middle ground between like uh, in in the course of evolution of the birds from reptiles. Okay, here is this is the uh, probably the common ancestor, the common ancestor. Of between reptiles, uh, uh, present day reptiles, and the birds. So probably that's what, uh, although actually I didn't really um, check myself correctly what was the wording uh, in those days at science textbook in high, high school uh, <coughs> biology. But anyway, the, this organization has a protest this. Um, so as a consequence, the uh, Ministry of Education uh, uh, upheld that uh, protest and then totally eliminate this description of uh, Archaeopteryx and even uh, related evolution, the, te the sentences describing whole the theme of evolution at all together. And even that changes. Uh, when unnoticed, I think it's like for, uh, for quite some time, like I think it's a couple of years or I think, and uh, until the foreign uh, scientific journals like uh, Nature and Science uh, noticed and then reported this issue, like uh, we see over here, this under the big title heading of the particular issue of nature, South Korea surrenders to creationist demand. And that's how the domestic scientists and those uh, who uh, have an interest or involved uh, well, uh, became aware of these uh, changes. And then they uh, did some action to put this description back into the high school biology textbook. Uh, so it's been always a consistent uh, battle, kind of a little battle, between those who uh, believe in the creationism and those uh, scientists who believe in uh, the evolution, theory of an evolution. 
not only in this country, but many, and actually in the United States, there are uh, there have been several incidences actually uh, happened. So there also this whether they should teach the uh, this evolution in the school, in public school especially, or not, or even should we include the uh, both creationism and uh, and evolution in the same uh, biology classroom, uh, so that they have uh, this kind of a uh, the fair judgment uh, to the students. Uh, well, to me, at least, uh, one thing that I can uh, say clearly is, uh, as a, one of a biologist, uh, as a scientist, there is a, not a single uh, logic, uh, logical ground that I should consider any uh, the possibility of creationism um, ever actually as a one of a possible factual thing as it is uh, currently in the form of this currently described in uh, the Bible at least but uh, uh, still those strong uh, <coughs> the belief is very important to those who are in the that religion and nobody has any right to actually uh, stop them uh, believing in their uh, the doctrine. Uh, on the other hand, uh, like I said earlier uh, in the course, it's not only one thing about the little theory regarding this uh, theory of evolution. If we actually uh, have any kind of compromise or abolish uh, this description of evolution or as a Hey, what about we just simply put this evolution aside and then uh, focus everything else on it in the biology? That is not possible. Everything, everything in literally everything in biology is built upon. Is it the evolution has the very uh, bottom foundation of all these biological uh, branches, little different branches. So that is not. And not only it is an acceptable, but and that is not even possible with that. So, so why don't we simply stay, uh, let the evolution only and let's stay in the biology discussion of biology? And outside of this biology, yes, you can talk everything, uh, anything, whatever you want. So just don't, just don't interrupt the discussion of biology because we do have a certain rule. Speaking of this, any science, we go by certain specific rule set up in in the logical way of discussing science, and that is only simply we are following it, and uh, nothing that cannot be judged under the same rule of this logic can interrupt this way of a logical debate. Uh, so, having said that, so anyway, uh, this Archaeopteryx, actually there were, the earlier uh, than these Archaeopteryx, there have been the actual flying dinosaur, which is totally different from Archaeopteryx, because this uh, pterosaur, uh, this flying, another flying uh, dinosaur, had a totally different type of morphological and anatomical wing structure. Uh, unlike this Archaeopteryx, basically their wings are more uh, similar to those of birds, like a feathery birds. So, uh, actual evolutionary, uh, the phylogenetic tree uh, wise, pterosaurs uh, are located over here. So there must be some common ancestor uh, between many different forms of dinosaur, including this pterosaur. However, this bird, uh, a branch of one particular uh, the sector of dinosaur. So what we can say about this Archaeopteryx is maybe somewhere in, in some stage at the step over here, uh, maybe Archaeopteryx lies on over here towards uh, the evolution of actual birth, modern day birth, perhaps. So, that's, uh, but 
why in the first place we did we have to go through this type of turmoil in the high school biology textbook? But actually, it's uh, mainly at least part of this fault is on the scientists themselves because they were not really careful in choosing the wording of description in uh, the textbook. So they somehow allow so some of the room for attacks. Okay, this is incorrect. What you said is, is not really entirely true. So this whole sentence should be uh, eliminated entirely. Type of attack was like, uh, you deserve the, those attacks because you were um, uh, negligent is at least what we can say about how, uh, why and how uh, it happened. The next uh, example of uh, the fossil record is also very interesting. Uh, its name is a tiktalic, uh, and it is an intermediate form between the fishes and amphibians. Amphibians are, those are like, the, they can both in, be inhabited in the water and uh, in the land. Like, uh, and amphibians have uh, four legs. On, uh, on the other hand, fishes do not have any legs. So this tectilic is a very much fish-like, however, having four digits, four legs, uh, their uh, anatomical form. And then uh, when we looked at this homologous structure, uh, perhaps we might have looked this tectilic uh, before uh, already. So all these present days mammals, okay, their arm structure, leg structure, were uh, indeed, anatomically speaking, uh, highly conserved in the structure of this tectonic uh, leg-like structure over here. So it's so uh, obvious that this uh, served as a starting uh, structural motif, foundation, from which all different forms of uh, animals, mammals in particular, uh, have been able to develop their own particular version of this uh, legs and then wings even in the, in the case of bats. And this is the actual the fossil. Uh, and these are based upon the fossil if we imagine what it might have looked uh, is the actual titanic form of uh, imaginary uh, the appearance of it. Uh, so they are actually humans are uh, arm and titanics that uh, the leg like structures are anatomically speaking uh, quite homologous. Uh, so it's kind of uh, you can assume safely that this one as a uh, something that origin of this tectalic leg structure. And another example, this evolution of whale. Uh, this whale, uh, as we all know by now, so somehow uh, once the ancestor of whales lived on land and then they somehow just uh, decided to return to sea. So they actually went back home, um, so to speak. So then fossil records, there were several fossil records indicating that, yeah, we are the missing link, so, so to speak, like between the present day whale and the land animal, so to support uh, to pro provide any evidence that all those whales uh, were actually deri derived from some ancestral form of the land mammal. Uh, so, uh, we can take a look at this as in the form of a short movie, uh, short, uh, a minute after. The bottom line is, in certain area of, of uh, the present day actually is in Pakistan, uh, several, the gradual uh, transitional form of this uh, whale 
evolution have been identified. So this was the the most recent form of such a fossil uh, record. So it now this form almost like resembles present day whales, but still retaining these uh, leg structures and also their mouth parts uh, still haven't. Mm. So are uh, those of those land mammals? But so these are more accurate anatomical uh, structure form of uh, this comparison in between but the much older there are two other older uh, fossil form of the related fossil forms show that actually uh, the transitional the evolution of this land mammal into this and then gradually now it became uh, whales so found so with that and also, of course, in, in many other uh, supporting evidences. So that's how we can uh, be certain that this whale's origin is uh, one of the land dwelling, once land dwelled uh, mammals. Uh, so that's here, those descriptions we can see on this short uh, movie so let's uh, let's watch this together 안녕하세요 북툰입니다 저는 지난 영상에서 중간 단계 화석이 없다는 주장은 창조과학 측의 가짜 뉴스입니다 라고 말씀드렸습니다 그 뒤로 많은 분들이 그러면 중간 단계 화석의 예를 보여달라는 댓글을 달아주셨는데요 저는 몇몇 분에게 답변 대신 책 화석은 말한다를 권해드렸습니다 왜냐하면 중간 단계 화석은 구글링으로도 얻을 수 있을 만큼 자료가 많지만 이 책이 풍부한 해부학적 설명을 곁들여 중간 단계 화석들을 잘 정리해 두었기 때문입니다. 네, 어쨌든 오늘은 중간 단계 화석들을 영상으로 한번 소개해 보겠습니다. 먼저 중간 단계 화석이란 무엇일까요? 쉽게 떠올리자면 중간 목, 중간 다리 같이 진화 과정을 한눈에 보여주는 화석. 물고기에서 양서류로, 양서류에서 파충류로, 파충류에서 포유류로 넘어가는 전이 과정을 입증하는 화석들이 중간 단계 화석에 해당될 겁니다. 사실 중간 단계 화석이란 진화를 직선형 개통도만으로 생각하다 보니 더 크게 부각되는 의미이기도 합니다. 직선 개통도로 보면 생태계를 묶는 방식이 지극히 단순해집니다. 그래서 빠진 고리가 더 부각되고 모든 생물이 정교한 형태로 진화할 것이라는 오해를 낳기도 합니다. 그러나 진화는 높은 단계로 올라가는 사다리가 아니라 수많은 개통들이 서로에게서 자라나 뻗어나가는 나무와 같습니다. 나무로 보면 방향성이 아니라 다양성이 보이고 그 속에서 생물의 전이 과정도 자연스럽게 이해되는 것입니다. 나무 개통도에 대해선 기회가 되면 다른 영상에서 자세히 다루어 보기로 하고 오늘은 최대한 직선 개통도로 표현해서 중간 단계 화석들을 한번 소개해 보겠습니다. 어쨌든 나무에게도 중간 단계 화석은 필요하니까요. 그럼 워밍업 차원에서 중간 다리, 중간 목 같은 화석부터 살펴볼까요? 기린이나 브라키오사우루스의 긴 목은 다윈의 자연 선택서를 설명할 때 빠지지 않고 등장하는 단골 예시입니다. 그러다 보니 진화론을 반대하는 쪽에서도 중간 목 화석이 없다는 점을 단골로 강조해 왔습니다. 하지만 목이 긴 용광류 공룡의 중간 단계 화석들은 이미 오래전에 발견되었습니다. 기린의 중간 단계 화석도 발견은 오래전에, 연구 발표는 최근에 이루어졌습니다. 목이 길어지는 전이 과정은 진화론으로도 화석 기록으로도 잘 설명되고 있습니다. 어떤 생물들은 화석 발굴 자체가 어려운 종들도 있습니다. 대표적인 예가 뱀입니다. 뱀은 수백 개의 섬세한 척추뼈와 갈비뼈로 이루어져 있고 대개는 부서지거나 분리되기 때문에 완전히 연결된 화석이 발굴되기가 극도로 어려운 생물입니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 네발 달린 도마뱀에서 다리 없는 뱀으로 전위를 보여주는 멋진 중간 단계 화석이 발견되었습니다. 2007년에 발견된 아드리오사우루스는 흔적만 남은 앞다리와 완전한 기능을 하는 뒷다리를 가지고 있었습니다. 2006년에 발표된 나자시 화석은 다음 단계인 흔적도 없는 앞다리와 기능을 하지 못하는 뒷다리를 가지고 있었습니다. 둘 사이를 이어주는 화석들은 그보다 먼저 발견되었습니다. 참고로 힘들게 발굴된 뱀 화석 중 어떤 것에도 발성기관이 있었다는 흔적은 없었다고 합니다. 뱀과 함께 세트로 창조과학측의 단골 메뉴에 오르는 생물은 거북입니다. 
1992년에 브리탄 가펫과 사전에는 거북의 중간 단계 화석이 없다는 내용이 있었는데 창조과학 측은 이 내용을 강연 자료에 자주 인용합니다. 하지만 중간 단계 거북은 2008년에 발견되었습니다. 오돈토 켈리스는 배딱지는 있고 등딱지가 없는 절반의 거북 화석이며 다른 파충류와 거북 사이의 전이 과정을 보여주는 중간 단계 화석입니다. 브리타니카에는 이 내용이 업데이트 되었습니다. 2008년에는 개구리와 도룡룡의 특징을 모두 가진 중간 단계 화석도 발견되었습니다. 그래서 게로바트라쿠스는 개구롱룡이라는 애칭으로도 불렸습니다. 개구롱룡은 몸은 도룡룡인데 개구리처럼 머리는 짧고 주둥이는 둥글며 큰 눈과 큰 고막이 있습니다. 또 다른 화석 트리아도 바트라쿠스는 현생 개구리의 모습과 조금 더 닮았지만 도룡룡의 특징도 아직 가지고 있습니다. 원시 양서류에서 현생 개구리의 과도기 과정도 화석으로 잘 채워지고 있습니다. 네, 워밍업이 끝났다 치고 이제 중간 단계의 시조 중의 시조를 한번 알아볼까요? 학명 아르카이옵테릭스 리토그라피카 일명 시조세 시조세 화석은 1860년에 처음 발견된 뒤로 현재 12개의 화석이 있습니다. 전 세계 학계에서는 시조세를 대표적인 공룡과 새의 중간 단계 화석으로 인정하고 있습니다. 상징성이 크다 보니 시조세는 집중 공격도 많이 받았습니다. 창조과학 측은 그동안 시조세 화석이 조작이라고 왜곡하거나 중간 단계가 아니라 그냥 새의 한 종류일 뿐이라고 주장해 왔습니다. 새라고 주장하는 근거는 외형입니다. 크기가 작고 날개가 달려있다는 이유입니다. 하지만 공룡이라고 모두 크지 않고 날개가 있다고 모두 새가 아니라는 것쯤은 초등학생도 아는 상식입니다. 화석 분류는 결코 외형만 따지지 않습니다. 해부학적 구조를 엄밀히 파악해서 종별 유사성을 분석하고 현대 들어서는 분자생물학의 도움도 받습니다. 시조새는 해부학적으로 새보다 공룡에 더 가깝습니다. 골격은 대부분 공룡과 닮았고 현생 조류에는 없는 이빨과 긴 꼬리뼈가 있습니다. 대부분의 수강류 공룡처럼 손가락이 3개이고 가운데 손가락이 깁니다. 반달형 손목뼈와 중간 발목뼈 관절 같은 공룡, 잉룡, 조류의 공통으로 나타나는 특징 외에도 100여 개의 해부학적 특징들을 분석해서 시조세를 수강류 공룡과 고등 조류의 과도기 단계로 분류하는 것입니다. 공룡과 새의 중간 단계 화석이 시조세 뿐이라 하더라도 모자람이 없겠지만 지금은 시조세 말고도 중생대 과도기 조류 화석이 수십 가지가 있습니다. 새로 발견되는 과도기 화석들 덕분에 비조류형 수강류 공룡과 고등한 조류 사이의 빈틈 대부분이 채워졌습니다. 새로운 중간 단계 화석들에 대해 미국의 장조과학 측은 대체로 무반응으로 대응하고 한국의 장조과학은 아직도 시조새에만 집착하고 있습니다. 새의 시조를 알아보았으니 이번에는 육상동물의 시조를 한번 알아보겠습니다. 바로 물고기와 네발 달린 육상동물 사이의 중간 단계입니다. 1881년에 발견된 에우스테노테로는 척추구조와 머리뼈의 패턴, 지느러미 등에서 네발 동물의 해부학적 특징을 가진 육기 어류였습니다. 에우스테노테로는 오랫동안 육기 어류가 네발 동물로 진화한 유일한 증거로 알려졌지만 지금은 네발 동물이 되어가는 단계 하나하나를 입증하는 화석들이 많습니다. 그 중에서도 결정적인 화석은 2006년에 발견된 틱타알릭입니다. 틱타알릭은 거의 완벽한 반 어류, 반 양서류 화석입니다. 틱타알릭의 비늘, 아래턱, 지느러미 줄기, 입천장은 어류형 동물의 특징을 가졌고 짧아진 머리뼈 천정, 움직이는 목, 손목 관절 등은 네발 달린 육상 동물의 특징을 가졌습니다. 그리는 땅 위와 물 속에서 모두 소리를 들을 수 있었습니다. 틱타알릭을 발견 덕분에 지금은 물고기가 무트로 나오는 근사한 과도기 단계가 만들어졌습니다. 에우스테노테론 같은 완벽한 수서성 육기 어류부터 양서류에 더 가까워진 형태를 거쳐 완전한 네발을 갖춘 형태로 부드럽게 이어집니다. 고래처럼 큰 동물이 마땅한 중간 단계 화석이 없을 땐 단골 메뉴에 오르기 딱 좋겠죠. 실제로 고래는 1980년대 초까지 고대 고래 화석들은 있었지만 고래와 비슷한 특징이 있는 포유류 화석이 거의 확보되지 않아서 창조과학 측의 집중 공격 대상이었습니다. 그러나 1983년에 파키케투스가 처음 발견된 뒤로 고래의 중간 단계 화석 발견이 빠르게 늘어났습니다. 파키케투스는 고대 고래와 비슷한 해부학적 특징들을 가졌는데 귀의 구조를 보면 물속에서도 소리를 들었을 것으로 추측되었습니다. 그리고 1994년에는 마침내 고래와 육상 포유류의 딱 중간에 있는 특성을 가진 암블로케투스가 발표되었습니다. 이후 달라니테스와 로도케투스, 타크라케투스, 가비오케투스 같은 중간 단계 화석들이 계속 발견되면서 
유재류, 즉 발굽 달린 포유류에서 원시 고래까지의 전이 과정도 훌륭하게 설명되었습니다. 고래의 중간 단계 화석들이 갑자기 늘어난 것에 당황한 미국의 창조과학 측은 고래의 뒷다리를 물고 늘어졌습니다. 창조과학 강연자 듀웨인 기시는 현생 고래에는 뒷다리가 없기 때문에 뒷다리가 있는 화석들은 고래가 아닌 다른 종으로 봐야 한다는 주장을 펼쳤습니다. 또다시 외형만 보고 화석 증거들을 부정한 것입니다. 하지만 기시는 현생 고래에도 뒷다리가 있다는 사실을 몰랐습니다. 물론 기능을 하는 다리는 아니지만 볼기뼈와 넓적다리뼈의 흔적이 근육 속에 깊이 파묻혀 있어서 겉으로 보이지 않을 뿐입니다. 고래의 중간 단계 화석들은 숨어있는 뒷다리 외에 수백 가지의 해부학적 증거들로 입증되었습니다. 그리고 분자 생물학적 분석으로 현재 고래의 육상동물 조상은 하마와 가장 가까운 것으로 알려졌습니다. 이외에도 양막류에서 당국류와 원시포유류로 넘어가는 전이 과정은 포유류의 폭발이라고 불릴 정도로 화석 기록이 풍부합니다. 종과 종 사이의 전이 과정을 연속적으로 보여주는 화석들, 특정 뼈의 진화 과정을 잘 보여주는 해부학적 중간 단계 화석들, 동물뿐 아니라 식물과 미화석의 중간 단계 화석들까지 중간 단계 화석들 이름만 열거 해도 1시간이 넘는 영상이 나올 정도입니다. 중간 단계 화석은 과거에도 있었고 현재는 더 빠른 속도로 발견되고 있습니다. 고생물학자 도널드 프로세로는 현대의 화석 발굴 속도가 화석을 분석할 인력과 시간이 턱없이 모자랄 정도로 빠르다고 말합니다. 명백한 중간 단계 화석이 보고될 때마다 창조과학 측이 주로 대응하는 방법은 조작이라고 왜곡하는 것입니다. 그렇게 왜곡한 자료를 대중들에게 전파하면서 과학계에 대한 불신을 조장합니다. 화석은 발굴하는 일도 어렵지만 분석하고 검토하는 작업은 더 어렵습니다. 화석이 발견되면 수백 수천 점의 다른 화석들과 해부학적 비교를 하고 몇 년에 걸친 연구 과정 끝에 학계에 발표됩니다. 그 뒤로도 해당 분야 학자들의 혹독한 검증 과정을 거쳐야 학계의 인정을 받습니다. 이러한 검증 과정은 화석뿐만 아니라 과학계 전반에 자리 잡은 시스템입니다. 한두 사람의 조작으로 무너질 시스템도 아니고 수만 점의 화석이 가짜로 등록될 수 있는 시스템도 아닙니다. 과학 문명을 이끈 이런 시스템에 불신을 조장하는 단체가 있다면 참으로 슬픈 일이 아닐 수 없습니다. 책 화석은 말한다는 이외에도 수많은 중간 단계 화석들을 소개하고 있습니다. 해부학적 특징, 화석이 발견된 배경, 학계의 검증 과정도 재미있게 알려줍니다. 그래서 중간 단계가 없다고 주장하시는 분들에겐 필독서가, 나머지 분들에겐 재미있는 교양서가 되리라 생각합니다. 다시 한번 답글 대신 이 책을 추천드립니다. 이상 북툰이었습니다. 시청해주셔서 감사합니다. Okay, uh, that I think is uh, uh, bears a lot of very interesting and important uh, messages about the evolution and then also the fossil evidence uh, as one of the tools to support this uh, theory of evolution. Uh, I think. And so moving on to another example of uh, the fossils that uh, from which we can <coughs> uh, learn a lot about uh, this animal evolution is the evolution of the horse. So to sum up the evolution of present-day modern modern horses. Uh, can be summarized in, uh, in having as if it has a, this type of some kind of a trend. So there were a uh, big change in body size. It got bigger in body size. So one of the ancestral form of a horse uh, was a very small size, like a present day a big cat or a small dog size. And also this reduction in tone numbers and uh, two size also uh, have changed and also its shape. So overall, what you can uh, have uh, this the, the beginning and the present day result, uh, the end result. So uh, hierarchical theorem, maybe it's a hierarchical or hierarchical theorem is pronounced as a uh, was the ancestral form of the horse when it's a very small body size and also uh, does not have a separated toes and smaller molar the two size became 
big body size and a bigger molar and now all fused one hoofed uh, toe. But then this uh, seemingly uh, separate the isolated incidence of the changes uh, throughout the evolution of a horse. So actually, if you think about it, it's all related to it. They are all interrelated together to, uh, to necessitate the present day of a horse, uh, the body form. Uh, if you consider the, uh, their habitat, the origin, the ancestor of a horse, Hierocotherium, uh, used to live in deep in the forest, small body size, so they better uh, live in inside of forest so that they can hide easily from potential many potential predators. So in the forest, their uh, main food must have been this the soft fresh leaves. So their eating diet habit uh, can be characterized as uh, this. Uh, the browsers. So they move around and then took some of those uh, the flesh soft leaves hanging on the tree branches. So that's how they usually uh, ate. Uh, so they didn't need to have any stronger hooped legs or uh, their diets are uh, easy to digest, a soft one. Their tooth structure did not need to have any very sturdy, strong, and big teeth. Then something has changed. So, and these animals had to change their form into this all over, uh, maybe a drastic change. Of course, it's, I'm not saying it is like uh, this change was made overnight, uh, but, but where, what, what kind of uh, the changes uh, made this transition necessary? The climate. Climate change was the one behind this. Uh, so they were comfortably, safely uh, hiding in the forest, but those forests have disappeared due to climate change. There was some of the evidence actually supporting this idea of a certain period on Earth, there were a big scale of climate change uh, that uh, eliminated a lot of the forests into open grassland. Now what happened is you now in they were not uh, not any longer they were able to protect themselves in in playing hiding game. They are like exposed. Suddenly they were exposed in the open field like in, on grass due to this uh, climate and the habitat changes. Now under such a circumstance, if you consider what's before, when they were living in the forest, perhaps a smaller body and all, all kind of other related uh, physical features might have been uh, something that beneficial uh, for their survival. However, those structural characteristics or traits that help in, uh, in better adaptation must have been also changed. Like here in the open field, Big body size, obviously, will definitely help uh, running from the predators. So those who cannot run uh, long enough, fast enough, due to their smaller, weaker uh, physical ability, must have been <coughs> succumb to the predators, okay. unfortunately. So those traits, those who bearing this trait must be able to pass their genes onto the next generation, so that's how they. And also, together with this big body size, a strong body size, and this hooped, fused, hey, 
fused tool will uh, provide, would have been able to provide the uh, benefit, obviously. Anybody who played uh, basketball regularly would know uh, this finger is the one of the weakest and the most vulnerable spot that you can sprain uh, during the playing of basketball. So if somehow instead of having separated these uh, digit fingers, uh, if one had this old fused fingers, you can reduce uh, tremendously, reduce the chance of the risk of spraining your toes. And once you sprain your toes, then you are like uh, you are finished in an open field. So that's probably must have led to the evolution of this fused toe. And their diet. Once very soft uh, leaves on trees were available abundantly, but on grassland, only tough grasses are the only food available for them. So you should be able to uh, digest them easily so that in order to do that, you better have, have a really strong, sturdy, uh, tough a grinder in your teeth. That's how these horses uh, should have developed this much larger, tougher uh, teeth. So their diet habit now is being described as a grazers, not a browser anymore. So all this, uh, even we look at only these three main uh, characteristic changes towards the evolution of a horse, we can easily re uh, <coughs> relate, agree that these three traits are actually, those are interrelated in providing the selective advantages of uh, this horse in a different environment. Is So that's why uh, the example of this evolution of a horse is very uh, valuable kind of exemplary lesson uh, in how actually this process of evolution by natural, under natural selection process is being operated. So, yes. On the, uh, another thing actually we should not forget is once, if you look at only this two big pictures, starting point and the end point, present day horse, then you may actually have like a misconception of oh this one has a as you have also seen in the previous short movie uh, that uh, that fact was also mentioned we usually have a, a like an error of uh, thinking this evolution as a certain linear thing no it isn't actually throughout this course of evolution this uh, also has happened in the form of like tree like all diversification encompassing all these possible uh, variations are also generated uh, during the course. So here is actually a more accurate picture of this evolutionary tree of the horus. Uh, the only thing is we don't know why and how all these other branches of the horses uh, are not being found the present days. For some reason we don't know yet, uh, they were not able to su sustain their uh, the, the genes. Uh, only, on the other hand, only this small group, small branch group, were able to survive here. So that's, you have this kind of misconception of, okay, this one has uh, directly jumped into this through one linear like uh, development. No, it is not uh, the case. And this one also has a, a little bit of this type of uh, misinterpretation or at least mispresentation uh, in the uh, dis description of high school biology uh, textbook uh, earlier. I don't know. Uh, by now they have actually uh, a little bit of editing and then changed this one or not, but uh, they have simply kind of a, uh, describe this as a like linear, like a straightforward transition from this original form into only single 
uh, present day form. And the, in describing human evolution, we do have that uh, type of similar mistakes, uh, frequently. Like, we kind of know some earlier form of a human, ancestral form of humans, then we already assume that these uh, transitions have been made like a linear form. No, it is not. It should, we should not actually consider that as a, the case. Uh, same thing. Uh, during the course of such human evolution, it must have generated so many different branches. And for some reason, we are the only one who were able to survive. For some reason, the other branches uh, could not make it. Is a take home message. So, uh, as we even uh, went over this, DNA sequence comparison is the most reliable way of building phylogenetic trees uh, because. This one I have already went over during the recitation session, so I'm not going to go over this thing uh, once again. Uh, so hopefully everyone uh, understands uh, very much about the rationale behind why uh, we these days are heavily uh, are dependent upon this using DNA sequence comparisons. Uh, in, because there are so many occasions that actually simply using DNA sequence comparisons so then we have the most accurate uh, assessment among different uh, organisms because these whole assumptions are, uh, after all, these are all based upon this common ancestral thing and uh, this DNA sequence change you can provide the most accurate the time-wise, the most accurate, the amount of time ha that uh, has elapsed between two branching points uh, from a single common ancestor is the reason why. Uh, by the way, this one, this particular evolutionary tree uh, diagram, although this one you can also generate a similar thing or maybe even identical things using the conventional the conventional way of uh, the practice of phylogenesis, phylogenetics. However, this particular one was actually generated by uh, simply only using the DNA sequence uh, comparisons. And as you can see, uh, it's quite uh, accurately generated these relative relationships. And this one can even this type of DNA sequence uh, comparison can become more uh, obviously valuable uh, in the case that if you want to utilize this in like, not within this similarly related like animals or mammals, but if you want to compare your relationship with the uh, human versus a certain type of different bacteria. There is no way you can uh, have any clue of uh, the relative relationship uh, by using conventional like morphological and anatomical differences. So that's uh, another occasion where you can uh, see the beauty and the power of DNA sequence comparison. Okay, so... Make sure that we can move on to the final section of this uh, evolution, the uh, our own evolution, the human origin and evolution of human. So we all know that uh, chimpanzees are the the closest uh, relative of a present day human. So anatomically speaking, we do have a actually very strong resemblance uh, with chimpanzee, even though chimpanzee is not even a member of the same genus uh, as human. So many related uh, chimpanzees and monkeys, would, uh, together they are called, grouped as a primates. So definition-wise, the uh, primates refers to a group of eutherians, it's called the eutherians, its name is the eutherians, including uh, several different types of monkeys, lemurs, uh, tarsiers, monkeys, and apes. Uh, if you are not sure what they were, yeah, here are some of the p 
pictures of Lemu and Tarsian and some of our other apes. Okay, so these are kind of all the distant relatives of all humans. Okay, but in terms of the same genus, other members of a more human-like uh, species are all extinct, unfortunately, but we are the only surviving member of this genus Homo. So it's, uh, uh, it indicates, the evidence indicates that uh, chimpanzee and human got split uh, from, uh, in about four to six million years ago, million years ago, this. So those, one branch split from the common ancestor between chimpanzee and human, present-day human, we call those group as hominins. So hominins include humans and other extinct human relatives. So those relatives are, uh, some those relatives are Australopithecus, uh, the one that I uh, love to use its name in my high school days whenever I uh, tried to, wanted to insult one of my uh, friends. Hey, you Australopithecus, how dare you can challenge me like I used to uh, play jokes like that. Uh, so that was very uh, silly jokes. Uh, I regret that by now. Uh, and Homo habilis, so this is kind of a, the, the linear-like. So we believe that Homo habilis got evolved from uh, Australopithecus. There were, of course, I mean, there must have been some kind of in the middle, like the common ancestor must have existed. Okay? It is not actually entirely the linear transition where all Australopithecus got eliminated and then all changed its form into Homo habilis and then uh, sometime later this whole Homo habilis became Homo erectus like the, the next form. No, it is not. Okay, It's always like branch-like things. Okay, uh, And the Neanderthals, uh, which is more famous uh, among the other forms of uh, human relatives. So, like this, Australopithecus, Homo habilis. By the way, this Homo habilis actually indicate that those who were able to begin to uh, use the tools, hand tools, is what this name indicates, uh, habilis. And then Homo erectus means back then, only by then, they were able to stand upright completely before they were moving like crawling like this, like me always, and Homo. Uh, so here, in this uh, figure, actually this Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens were <coughs> described as something a little bit differently. Here, uh, it's, it reads, Homo sapiens Neander, uh, Neanderthalensis, whereas we are referred as Homo sapiens as sapiens. Uh, it's like here the notion, convention is this the last word uh, indicates the subspecies name, just like the Canis lupus familiaris uh, indicates the domesticated dogs. Because Homo sapiens, this Neanderthals and, uh, and we, Homo sapiens, according to the biological species concept, uh, we should consider these both groups as one single species because they are reproductively, they are not, they were not isolated. They were able to interbreed. If that was the case, then, uh, the more accurate way of uh, expressing them is the same scientific name like Homo sapiens but only having the different subspecies name like Neanderthalensis versus uh, sapiens is how they are described in this figure. 
Uh, but on many other occasions, like simple people use the older conventions where uh, Homo sapiens Neanderthal lenses is not, instead of they are just simply called the Neanderthals and we are called the Homo sapiens. Okay, so these are um, the difference between when you consider this as a linear uh, transition form, whereas this is more accurate way of like every branches you have some specific uh, the common ancestors among all these different uh, human relatives like Homo erectus and Havilis and uh, Australopithecus including and but anyway one thing is certain that regardless so whatever it is regardless we do throughout during the course of this human evolution we had some one particular trend the the head size the cranial size became bigger and larger to some uh, extent if you have a larger uh, head which means a larger volume of brain then uh, you can actually uh, uh, upgrade your intellectual uh, abilities, a common uh, yeah, belief, notion. To some degree, it's true, but not always. Like uh, it's true. I have a big head guy, but I'm very stupid. Like, yeah. and also bipedalism is called like you stand up and then now you walk upright, unlike a chimpanzee. So. Uh, once you have this uh, entirely, the, once you become, once you become a full-time bipedal uh, organism, like chimpanzees still can walk uh, in, using the two legs, but a lot of times they kind of have a sort of in in between in the middle ground. They have to use also their four legs to uh, in moving. But once you become the full. Uh, uh, the bipedal erect uh, individual organism like a homo erectus uh, did then you can enjoy so many uh, uh, benefits one of them is now you can travel such a huge such a long distance uh, believe it or not we are humans are we're not as strong as tigers and any other uh, strong uh, like uh, animals uh, lions or tigers but the one thing that we can uh, have a like a very strong trait is the walking distance using this only two legs movement we can really really have a, such a long distance travel it might have a uh, to help the tremendously about in migration so that you can have a better habitat so then establish a new environment a better environment that's how you were able to prosper is one thing that you can imagine okay having said that now uh, we can jump directly into the theory of our origin uh, uh, what is our origin the theory uh, states that the uh, we were all derived from africa the present day human, all humans, wherever you live, the originally they were all you are all derived from Africa. Okay, so in other words, at some point uh, in the in the past, in the all long past, uh, there were only humans who were only uh, living inside of an Africa. Outside of the Africa, no human uh, have lived. And then some group migrated out of Africa and then spread uh, all over the other area of the Earth is the, that, uh, the theory. Um, so who made this transition, the migration? Uh, we believe that was one small subgroup of Homo erectus uh, first attempted this Homo erectus. Migrated out of, uh, and then they settled in nearby the Eurasia nearby uh, which is uh, closer to Africa but uh, unfortunately they were not uh, really very successful there in uh, adapting to their new environment so they all extinct but leaving only some small subgroup who 
evolved into Neanderthals. Okay, so now originally Homo erectus, but then some small group who became Neanderthals, but everybody else got all extinct. That's what happened in about one million years ago. But then this migration has also happened another second time around, more in, in more recently, like something instead of one million, but uh, instead of the, like 150 or 200,000 years ago, very recent, relatively speaking. Another group uh, have attempted, another small group uh, of individuals, humans, have attempted to move out of Africa. Okay, so that means still there are there are those who living there originally in Africa uh, still there uh, lived. So that's why actually in, in these days, if you compare uh, this DNA sequence among different humans uh, worldwide. The most DNA sequence diverse they can be found, well, guess what, where? In Africa. Because the, all those descendants uh, living outside of Africa are uh, originally derived from very small group of individuals who migrated out of Africa. That's why your DNA, the genetic diversity is much less than those much larger group still lived there in at the at the time of migration in Africa. That's the reason why. And so anyway, they move out, and then this time around they were very successful. And so not only in the Eurasia, but also everywhere else, they actually moved out, migrated, and then prospered. And we are all the descendants of that uh, migration instance. So it can be summed up in this uh, diagram. So according to this out of Africa theory, uh, original migration, they all stopped. But only one small subgroup who became Neanderthals. But then another attempt, Homo sapiens, is now still going on in all different area of the earth okay so in other words when they had when they had this second time they were already this uh, this second time around like only about 100,000 years ago the kind of uh, humans are our direct ancestor the homo sapiens okay when they have this migration, especially in Europe, there must be some native humans living there, who the Neanderthals must have been living there, and then these newcomers uh, must have actually collided, well, uh, at least then mildly put, uh, overlapped, must have uh, uh, overlapping habitats at least in this area because that's the area uh, of the Neanderthals were living back then okay. so yeah that's what I'm saying coexist with Neanderthals in Europe and so this uh, illustrate this migration, actually our ancestor, our own ancestor, must have an origin from the western part of, well, not western, the eastern part of, uh, northeastern part of Africa, and some group uh, arrived here inland of uh, Africa, whereas others migrated out throughout these eventually uh, arriving even at the uh, at the very bottom of the South America even sometime later. Okay, so this along with that uh, migration and revolution and we only talk about Neanderthals but however uh, here at least if we uh, 
look up this early days of Homo sapiens, recent Homo sapiens, not only this Neanderthals, so many other uh, branches of uh, related humans must have existed. Uh, for example, like Homo heidelbergensis uh, and Denisovans and uh, Homo florensiensis and we, Homo sapiens. Several different groups of this, so to speak, recent Homo sapiens. Uh, the existence of them uh, can be found in here and there in many areas of the Earth. Okay. Uh, so, all these are like must have been some the result of several other migrations uh, originally from Africa, of course. And now the task is. Okay, so now we, uh, all those fossil evidence suggest, not suggest, not only suggest, but indicate, and at least you have this one, two, three, four, five different uh, human, modern present day, uh, day human relatives must have existed, coexisted, point is, at the time of this period coexisted um, throughout the world, then how do we uh, assign the relative relationship? Who is the most closest relative to us among them? How do you find out? Well, of course, you, you rely on the DNA sequence comparison. So if you want to actually do this task of the DNA sequence comparisons among these already extinct old humans, or even you might have a other kind of interest in like present day living human, all the different human races. You may be curious about okay, who is as a Korean, for example, who is the closest relative, who is the most close, the closest uh, brothers and sisters to Koreans, to tribal Koreans, maybe Mongolian or Japanese or Chinese. How do you know? Just by looking at, we must then, uh, the Mongolian must be the closest relative because both Mongolians and Koreans are like this. <laughs> you cannot, you cannot determine those. So in that is uh, occasions, as well as this uh, occasion of uh, trying to determine the relative relationship among all these deceased or extinct human uh, relatives. Yeah, this is the time that you need to utilize this DNA sequence comparison. However, uh, instead of for that type of task, because of, you are trying to compare, make this uh, comparison uh, among this relatively close the individuals, one quick way of assigning such a relationship is instead of comparing all entire your genome DNA sequence, uh, the better, quicker way is compare only the DNA sequence of, for example, like mitochondria, or in some cases, a white human Y chromosome DNA. So this my, mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome DNA comparison has been very valuable, instrumental in uh, decide, uh, like determining the origin, where, the, who is our most uh, close, the, the, the closest relatives, or like I said, another occasion that can be utilized is among today's existing human races, the, uh, in, if you are curious, uh, curious about interrelationship among them, is where you can use this. Why mitochondria DNA? The benefit of using uh, in mitochondrial DNA sequence in such occasion is, so one is like once if you didn't know for uh, to. First off, if you didn't know, like mitochondria has DNA, yes, they do. 
uh, mitochondria contains their own independent genome. What's mitochondria? Let's, let's draw mitochondria. This is uh, like, let's say this is a eukaryotic cell. All eukaryotes have mitochondria as a, a, one of the major organelles. So if this is nucleus, usually nucleus is the place where you can expect to find your DNA. Yeah, DNA. But it is a chromosomal DNA. But there is another place, especially in, in, in the animal uh, cell. An animal and a fungi, of course. Yeah. Uh, here, less enlarged mitochondria. Of course, the size of mitochondria is not as big as this, but mitochondria look like this. It consists of a double layer, the double cell membrane, like this two membrane type thing. Inner membrane has this folded structure, and inside of which they do have several copies of their own DNA. Unlike, unlike this chromosomal DNA, which is linear, linear, but this mitochondrial DNA is a circular. Although much, 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 much smaller than the chromosomal DNA, but this is a uh, very tiny comparatively speaking, but it is a circular DNA, and this circular DNA is actually uh, the characteristic, typical characteristics of the new uh, prokaryotic. Bacteria and archaeobacteria DNAs are circular, uh, but anyway. Uh, Actually, this is one of the strong evidence, uh, supporting evidence that the uh, explaining the origin, the origin of uh, mitochondria. And similarly, you can also find a similar feature in the chloroplast. Chloroplast also consists of this two membrane uh, structure, and also inside of the chloroplast, you do have a similar, this circular, tiny, uh, several copies of uh, their own genome. It is a multiple uh, duplicated copy of uh, their so this DNA is, is their own genome in other words mitochondria or chloroplast contain their own independent genome right so these are actually one of the uh, very strong supporting evidence that uh, indicating that their origin is a independently living prokaryote somehow trapped inside of this big eukaryotic cell but uh, obviously we are going to talk about that uh, theory later uh, on when we get to the the chapter of the cells but here the mitochondria has dna right so this is this mitochondria dna we are going to utilize this so this is a better uh, picture instead of my own ugly drawing yeah you can see clearly so here, if you enlarge this mitochondria, actually you have uh, uh, many, many, many copies of mitochondria in a single animal cell, or a single fungi cell, or a single plant cell. Plants also have uh, mitochondria. And each of these uh, mitochondria contains several, this is a circular DNA. So if we use this mitochondria DNA and the DNA sequence comparison with the another individual's mitochondrial DNA, then we have some kind of clear idea of this evolutionary relationship. So one benefit is uh, it doesn't have any recombination, the process of recombination. What do you mean recombination? Nuclear DNA, this chromosomal nuclear DNA, uh, undergoes always is this feature of a so-called recombination when they are about to produce the gametes, okay, like sperm and an egg in their specific type of cell division to produce these gametes. Uh, what they have is their chromosome in the nucleus, a diploid. Remember this diploid. All these eukaryotic cells 
are basically deployed, unless you are uh, like a tetraploid ploid or a triploid, you are basically your standard is deployed. Why? Because your whole genome you have inherited from half of them uh, from your mother and from another half from father. That's why you have this one the additional copy of each uh, version of your chromosome. And those chromosomes are called the homologous chromosomes. And when they are about to produce gamete, uh, in order to produce the correct gamete in each of which containing the full set of all entire gene, that means you don't want to miss any single chromosome in some other uh, cell during the course of this cell division. So how can you make sure that you bring everything together you know that you have one each of your chromosome you have an extra but if you don't want to miss so one easiest straightforward way of producing the gamete is simply split your cell into two halves uh, so reducing your chromosome into the, the amount of chromosome into this but by doing so, you have always a danger of losing or gaining some unnecessary uh, extra or uh, the missing part. So you are splitting your chromosome, but at the same time, you don't want to miss anything or you don't want to have uh, include any extra copies because you have to be a haploid now. In becoming a gamete, sperm or egg, you must become a haploid. So, so how can you accomplish this correct way of becoming a haploid? One very reliable uh, way of doing so is before you do that, you meet your partner, your homologous chromosome, and then split. Make sure that your partner, your partner homologous chromosome, does not come together with you in this division procedure. That's why during this gamete production, this particular type of cell division we call meiosis, you have to make sure that each chromosome meet the uh, each of partneric homologous chromosome uh, beforehand. But during this the encounter because they are homologous, they can be, this certain part can be exchanged, like, this can be crossed. And then when this crossed, tangled structure uh, is finally being resolved again, now this small part can be mixed up like this. This is called a recombination. And practically, what's the benefit of this recombination? By this doing so, you are doing as if you are shuffling your deck when you play your card. Uh, in, in the next round of a card game, before you go into the next round, you always like to have this uh, shuffling, uh, the card shuffling. And even though these homologous chromosomes are same kind of a chromosome, but actual actual nature of genes present on each particular area, part of the uh, homologous chromosome, could be different because DNA sequence. DNA sequence uh, or between DNA sequences on each homologous chromosome uh, don't have to be identical and cannot. You cannot expect these sequences could be 100% identical because even if they are homologous chromosome, but their origins one came from father, one came from mother. Those two individuals were, before they get married, those two individuals were totally, totally unrelated uh, individuals. So how can you expect their DNA sequence, exact DNA sequence uh, can be identical? So among this recombination means it will result in the some kind of a shuffling of your genes. That's why it is called the recombination. And so it can contribute to the in increasing the genetic diversity of the, the
the next generation, the offspring in the form of these gametes. So that's why uh, this recombination, the uh, practice of recombination still exists, uh, survives. Uh, yeah, this is another uh, illustration of this crossing over to become this a uh, little bit of a hybrid structure during <laughs> this uh, practice. However, in mitochondria, so this is what's happening in the nuclear uh, chromosome. But in mitochondria, the mitochondria DNA is uh, basically a prokaryotic DNA, so they are haploid. Prokaryotic DNAs are always haploid, almost always. Uh, so these haploids cannot have any luxury of this recombination because they don't have any homologous chromosome. So they don't have any rec uh, recombination, which is bad for in terms of increasing the genetic diversity, but which is very good for the sake of utilizing this in, in uh, determining the the evolutionary relationship among different individuals because that evolutionary relationship determination you must actually have uh, entirely you better have uh, entirely this DNA sequence changes are all coming from mutation only that is uh, something that you can rely on this an assumption because all DNA sequence changes uh, stemmed from mutation that means mutations will occur over time uh, randomly so it can serve as an indication of how long how long ago these two individuals got separated from a single common ancestor but if you have some kind of unknown variable like recombination it will uh, have a little bit of a confusion or confounding e e impact on the assess correct assessment of this the rate of mutation right although Overall, it is no big deal. Even if this, you can still have a overall basically pretty much correct estimation even with this. However, if you don't have, if you don't have to worry about this, any other factor than the mutation, it will be better. So that's why uh, this mitochondrial DNA uh, is a more popular choice of doing this practice. Okay. So, no recombination means uh, because they have no homologous chromosome, uh, that means a sequence variation is contributed by mutation only here in the case of mitochondria, basically. Another benefit of using this mitochondrial DNA in such tasks is unlike the nuclear DNA, or the chromosomal DNA only exists a single copy. Like in the form, of, although you have two copies, if you consider this homologous chromosomes, but like I said, uh, the DNA sequence between two homologous chromosomes could be different, right? But here it is identical copies, identical clones of multiple copies existing in a single mitochondria. Even in a single eukaryotic cell, usually contains uh, many many copies of a mitochondria, so it. Add up so much more material to analyze. So, especially if you have to do this pro as the research on the like material, hard to come by material like uh, a long on fossils like this. Imagine how how difficult would it be to extract intact DNA from uh, so like a million years ago, million years old the fossil samples. It will be extremely difficult, isn't it? But uh, in the case of mitochondria, the situation could be a little bit better because it can to start with, it can provide you with um, a little more amount because of these facts. So that's another uh, advantage of using this mitochondrial DNA in such sequence comparison. Another very uh, big uh, advantage is this. Mitochondrial DNA in, in mammals, in higher animals, and also in higher plants as well, it's get inherited only from mother's side. 
So even though sperms and eggs both uh, have this mitochondria, but the, guess what? The egg cells retain most of this whole cytoplasmic content, but whereas uh, sperm cells reduce entirely, dramatically reduce their volume, although they contain their several mitochondria, because mitochondria is the place where you can uh, get the energy of this uh, moving. Without mitochondria, they cannot uh, have any energy of this required for this fertilization procedure. However, for some reason, this fertilized egg, uh, once sperms got inside of this egg, uh, after finishing this fertilize, successful fertilization, all those paternal origin of mitochondria are uh, deliberately destroyed, leaving only maternal origins, mitochondria, for some reason. So anyway, bottom line is, this new individual, like me, Okay, I, I'm a male, however, all in my every cells, all those mitochondria are the ones that I received from my mother's side. Uh, not a single mitochondria I have received from my father. Yes. So these mitochondria are inherited only through mother, maternal origin. So the advantage is, so this during fertilization, all the cytoplasmic content is provided by female egg, of course. So the, uh, I think, uh, the advantage is, if you are only interested in following the specific, the female lineage. So actually there were once, this project has been uh, embarked on, the, uh, under the code name of the Mitochondrial Eve project. Like this biblical figure, Adam and Eve. So you are you are only following this lineages to go trace back the female origin of all entire living the human present day humans. And then it turned out that all these present day living females were all the descendants of. Uh, I mean, speaking of this outside of the Africa, of, of course, a descendants of a very small number of, a very small number of females originated from Africa was the thing that they have discovered uh, using this strategy. Okay. So, another thing is, What about this? The the human Y chromosome. Is uh, uh, another very popular item uh, employed uh, under this type of uh, essay analysis. Human Y chromosome has also a, a no recombination feature, and on the uh, unlike uh, mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosomes are transmitted only from male to male. This is paternal origin only. Uh, you easily understand why because female don't have any uh, Y chromosome, right? So only Y chromosome that I can the the source of the Y chromosome must be fa my father side. Uh, so. Under this logic that you can use this Y chromosome uh, in tracing the, the male origin as, con, uh, as opposed to this female origin determination. And what about this recombination? Why does this Y chromosome also does not have uh, any recombination feature? Because look up. If you see, take a look at this uh, photograph. Human. Female have two copies of X chromosome, so they align as a, during the the meiosis, the gamete production procedure of the cell division. They align these two X chromosome, homologous X chromosome align, and recombination can happen between these. But in male, uh, 
X chromosome has, there is only one copy of X chromosome and one copy of Y chromosome, and still they are regarded, technically are regarded as homologous chromosome, although they are not actually, in reality, they are not homologous uh, in present day of Y chromosome. They uh, went through a lot of this modification, and that's why. So here, there's no way they can have this kind of recombination. Recombination can only occur between the at least physically uh, morphologically identical parts but these between y and x chromosomes are not at all similar morphologically so in y chromosome uh, in the case of y chromosome there is no way they can have this any recombination right so same benefit at least from the aspect of this determination, evolutionary relationship de determination, Y chromosome can provide the similar benefit uh, of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, but that only pertains to the higher mammals. Frogs, their Y chromosome and X chromosomes are like uh, almost identical, so recombination can happen here. Sigmoid so chromosome, no recombination, uh, male to male. So it is an ideal uh, material to trace the uh, male origin. So this can be viewed as a Y chromosome atom project. And of course, uh, already scientists have uh, tried this strategy, and then it turned out that same thing. Uh, all those present day male uh, have this. The, some like indicate their ancestor as a, a few uh, small number of uh, individuals originally from Africa. Another interesting thing about uh, this Y chromosome tracing revealed uh, is that uh, majority of the human population, the Y chromosome, in male actually, if you trace the Y chromosome, present day, surprisingly high proportion of these males contained the who, the guess what, guess who? The genes, Y chromosome genes derived from Chinggis Khan in Mongolia. In this days, that's another very uh, interesting uh, fact. In other words, actually, uh, we had a, a lot of this, the gene transfer from it's not saying that the Genghis Khan himself as an individual uh, to transmit his gene into so much, so many population of a human and living today, but that means the gene pool from Mongolian tribe somehow, probably historical reasons due to, uh, have spread it as a higher instance of a spreading uh, in the vast majority of this human population is what uh, we can say about it. So another thing is uh, regarding that Neanderthals. So you can employ the same strategy to have this DNA sequence comparison between us, the Homo sapiens, and perhaps our uh, closest relatives actually probably, uh, other than chimpanzee, but among these humans, uh, the Neander, it must be uh, Neanderthals. Uh, if we do so, then we can no longer uh, rely on this only the mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome DNA sequence comparison. But you rather you better have actually entire reading of three billion DNA uh, nucleotide pairs. And actually, they did uh, in Germany. The uh, that renowned Max Planck uh, uh, Institute during this four year span, uh, they just uh, did uh, it's such an impressive uh, job of completing in sequencing three billion base pairs of a Neanderthal genome sequencing. Imagine, like a little. Beginning of in 1992, in the year 2000, during the 10 year span, uh, reading this human Homo sapiens genome, the human genome sequencing project, it took 10 years. Okay, from 
many, 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 many different in the, uh, research institutes in the United States as well as in Europe and even some in Japan. Okay, but still, ten years uh, it took. But in the case of this Neanderthal genome sequencing, you had to deal with not a flash sample that yes that are available like you know uh, limitlessly, but here you have only very limited source of this fossil Neanderthals, and then you have to extract DNA from all those dead bones or fossil fossilized bones. But still, uh, they were able to do this, accomplish this thing. And the result is the only thing that matters for, for us. And then it turned out that 99.7% uh, identical, the DNA sequence-wise. Relatively speaking, between chimpanzee and humans, 98.8%. So it's like only very small differences, but this difference, small difference, that is something that really matters. So anyway, in the case of Neanderthals and the humans, they are much more identical. Yeah, that's something that you have already expected. But more surprisingly, it's an interreading. Well, humans and uh, Neanderthals have an evidence of extensive gene changes through this inter, inter so to speak, interracial or interspecies uh, marriage. Uh, interbreeding. That means uh, Neanderthals and uh, Homo sapiens, us, are not, are not the separate species anymore if they can do this. They are actually the members of the same species. And actually, later on, it turns out that not only the Neanderthals, but other modern humans, like Denisovans and the Florences, uh, the reason why this Homo floresiens is, is called the habits. Uh, they are relatively then small statues, smaller uh, humans, mostly found in the, some area of Indonesia. And, and Homo heidelbergensis is another uh, such modern human. And they were among these this, 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 several different degrees, but all indicated that the evidence of this interchanges of uh, this gene exchanges through interbreeding, yes. So these are like a map of uh, such degree of extense, extent of uh, interbreeding among different like Neanderthals and Denisovans, what type of, what proportion of genes um, among population of this present day human on the global scale have is what this map indicates. But so, in the case of this Neanderthal Genome Project, what we have found is so many traces of their genes are still left in present-day human population. And, interestingly, uh, among them, uh, some of the very noticeable uh, the kind of genes were, like those genes are responsible for causing depression, allergy and heart attack, the circulatory uh, disease problems, diabetes and then addictions. So you name a few, but these are all the major, major modern day uh, like the illness. Modern day humans are like this, uh, most of us uh, suffering from. And it turns out that they were all like uh, originated from not us, but the Neanderthals. So the better part is, it's not our fault, but we can blame from now on, we can blame all these troubles on them, uh, the Neanderthals. That's what, uh, however, uh, to become more serious, what does that mean? Why all these bad genes, so-called bad genes, were all uh, something that turned out to be originated from Neanderthals? Does that mean does that mean that it is something that uh, justify their, their extinction? Yeah, they are the bearer of such bad gene, troubled genes. So uh, that is a real, one of the major reasons they must have ex uh, extinct. Uh, because they are the one who actually have this kind of inferior genes. We are the one... Uh, 
like an apple, better genes carrier. So we, yeah, there is a reason why we are the uh, like a survivor of throughout this uh, the races uh, among between the different races of this evolution. Uh, that's probably something uh, that kind of uh, we are tempted to jump onto as a, one of the quickest conclusion. Yeah. However, if you think about it a little longer, that shouldn't be the reason. The reason why, probably uh, one of the better, uh, more correct uh, interpretation of this type of uh, uh, fact finding is uh, those bad genes, so-called this diabetic genes, addictions, and the circulatory problem, and allergy is other kind of uh, genes that reflecting present days uh, total environmental change. In other words, when they were living back then in their own habitats, those genes at least must have not uh, caused any problem. Even some of the genes might have been beneficiary. Like, for example, allergy. The genes respo responsible for excessive allergy. Allergy is coming from more, more sensitive immune response. However, back then there were a lot of those uh, pathogens around with little help in the form of antibiotics or any other means of advanced uh, medicine and <clears throat> probably uh, a little bit of uh, oversensitive uh, allergy response might have been tremendous help uh, in fighting against those uh, pathogen attack, for example. So probably that is should be the correct assessment of why these genes that we got from, in terms of origin, we got from Neanderthals, but inside of our body in present day, modern days, so totally changed the environment. These genes started uh, causing the problem, but not in their own original body is probably uh, what we can have it. It's, a, it's my, our own correct takeaway is the last word uh, I can say out of this whole uh, <coughs> saga of human evolution. So with that, uh, I can finish the, the first part of the, this week's lecture. And several hours later, probably I will re resume the uh, recording of the uh, next uh, second session of the uh, lecture. So uh, until then, uh, see you.